risen. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, I, uh, I had the privilege of uh, working in public schools for several years, and uh, in Portland, where I was, they, uh, we had a lot of kids from the um, uh, Eastern Europe, and so some of them I learned how to say in different languages, they would say, Vaisimos uh, Vaskrais, and, uh, and we would respond, um, oh no, I forgot, it's been six years. Vaisimos Vaskrais Vaskrais. Oh, well, whatever it was, they would say he is risen in languages all over the world. And I, I share that each, each Easter. I love that fact that around the world, people are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And they're saying he is risen. He is risen indeed all over the world today. Um, matter of fact, I got uh, pictures this morning from O Sunny Day. They celebrated their Easter feast. Julie, my beautiful wife, is going to show you some pictures of that uh, during the announcement time. They celebrated their Easter feast already last night because it was Easter last night in Uganda. And so they, uh, they had a couple cows, literally, and some ice cream, and, uh, and it was awesome. Well, uh, I have the privilege of welcoming you guys today for our Easter service, and not only that, uh, but also introducing uh, our choir, which I am thrilled that they're performing for us today, not performing, yeah, yeah, go ahead and give them a hand. Um, Not performing, they are uh, leading us really in worship. And I do hope that you see it that way, that though, um, though we're excited to hear them, though we're thrilled that they're going to be singing for us and we're excited to see them, um, what they're doing up here is leading us into the presence of God through worship. So I pray that you would see this as what it is, worship, and that you would join with them and praise our resurrected Savior today with the choir as they lead us together. So, um, choir, would you come on up? Uh, come on up here, and then I'll pray and, and get us rolling. Woohoo! That's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome. Uh, also, you see all the beautiful and handsome choir behind me. Uh, the one you don't see is someone who put in a ton of work, which is Cindy Troutman sitting right here in the front row. Uh, woo! Cindy is the choir director, and so she's the, uh, the brains and the bronze behind this operation, and uh, she has put in a lot of hours, time, and effort making it happen, along with Cindy McDonald helping there. So I, I just want to give a thank to you to both Cindy's as well as to all the members of our choir. Thank you so much for uh, making today special and uh, for working so hard. Uh, and I've heard them practicing, and you guys are in for a treat. So would you go ahead and stand up with me, if you're able to, and uh, we'll pray together as we enter into worship. Oh, Father, thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for what it means that Jesus Christ is risen that he has risen from the dead, and because of that, every good and perfect gift is ours. Every blessing from heaven is available to us because of this day and what happened on this day almost 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Father. And I pray that the joy of the resurrection and the power of the resurrection would fill our hearts with faith and with eager hope and anticipation to what's to come. As we celebrate this morning, may your spirit fill us and draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank 
Thank you guys for working your way back to your seats. I appreciate that. Thank you for respecting that uh, extra social distancing section over there. For those at risk, I appreciate that too. I want to make sure that everybody uh, is able to access, access the Word of God, and comfortably so. All right. By the way, uh, I remembered. Christos vas Christ, vaisimos vas Christ. I know you guys have been sitting at the edge of your seat all, all worship long, thinking about that in your head. So I'm glad that I could help you out there. For those of you who came a little late, I forgot uh, how to say he is risen. He's risen indeed uh, in, was it Russian or Romanian at the beginning of service? So I, I apologize. Um, speaking of which, let's practice that together. Yeah. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are going to uh, ask the question, what do you get out of an empty grave? What do you get out of an empty grave? Because that's, that's kind of what today's about, right? Is that uh, some, some Jewish men and women went and found that a grave was empty. There was supposed to be a body in the grave and there was no body there. So what do you get out of an empty grave? What does that mean for you and for me? Um, and today this message is going to be in two parts. One is, how do you know the tomb was empty? Right? Can I trust that that tomb was actually empty? I, I hear preachers talk about it. I hear Christians say, he's risen, he's risen indeed, but how do I know? And the second question, then, is if it really was empty, what do I do with that? What does that mean to me? How do I handle that? And we'll look at different people. First, we're going to look at different reasons why we believe the tomb is empty, different questions that people might have about it. And second, we're going to look at uh, different ways that people in the Bible responded when they saw that empty tomb. Um, so would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come and celebrate together. And now as we look at the scriptures, I pray that you, your Holy Spirit would open up our hearts, our minds to receive what your spirit has inspired in the word of God. Lord, that it would speak to us and challenge us, encourage and exhort us. As you say, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture comes from you. And so I pray, Lord, now that you would breathe it to life in our hearts. Challenge us, Lord. And may your spirit do his good work of unpacking and explaining and applying. And help me simply, Lord, to be a willing and obedient vessel to you. And help each of our hearts to be open before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, so what are some of the ways that you guys celebrate Easter? An egg hunt. An egg hunt. Awesome. What else? Food. Food. That's right. How many people have ham on Easter? <laughs> Has that ever strike anyone as a little funny that ham is one of the traditional foods, but it's not kosher? Yeah, yeah just, just a little funny to me. Okay, so ham, Easter egg hunt. What else do we do to celebrate Easter? Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. That's right. That's right. We proclaim that he's risen. Where do we come? You guys come to church. That's right. I see you here. Awesome. So one of the big ways that we celebrate Easter is the egg hunt. Um, Julie and I, uh, we were looking for egg hunts that were open uh, during the chaos around us. And uh, we found uh, three listed online in Prineville. So we headed out to Prineville and made a day out of it. Uh, there was one at 10 a.m. There was one at, what was the next one? 11 a.m. And then there was another one at 2 p.m. And our plan was to hit all three egg hunts. We thought, why not? Why not? Let's just make a day of it and stay all day in Prineville. That was yesterday. And uh, you got a question? You remember something else that we do on Easter? Oh, your mom lives in Prineville. Awesome. Awesome. Pineville's a nice place. I liked it. I enjoyed it. So we, uh, so we got out there, and man, we rushed Saturday morning. We took a big family shower. We all got cleaned up and spiffed up and ready for, to be presentable for the egg hunt. We packed some snacks and stuff, and we got in that car, and we got there at 10.01. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. And it was supposed to be at the Ochoco Park, right? That's what the website said. So we got to the park, and there was nobody there nothing. And so then we thought, well, what church is doing it? We looked up what church it was, and we drove to the other side of Pineville to the church. Nobody there. Nothing going on. And we thought, what on earth is happening? And that's when we looked up, uh, looked, pulled back up the banner and found that it was from 2015. <laughs> Whoops! 
<laughs> Man, I'll tell you, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. You just can't trust. <laughs> Somebody needs to be like editing and keeping that stuff up to date, right? So, so we went back to Ochoco Park, we used the restrooms and we just played for an hour. And thankfully the 11 a.m. and the 2 p.m. were 2021. So we were good there. So we made the other two egg hunts, kind of, um, but, uh, but missed out on that first one. But the question is, why do we do egg hunts, right? What, what's the big deal with Easter eggs and, uh, and why the bunny? I, I'm, I'm not even going to get into the bunny. That's just weird. Bunnies, I, I hate to break, break anything for any children out there, but bunny don't lay eggs. Bunnies don't lay eggs. Okay, so, uh, but I have some chickens at home. I have six chickens at home, and they lay eggs. We get like four or five or six eggs a day from those chickens, and they do a great job. And we dyed a bunch of those eggs uh, to celebrate Easter. And, uh, and so, and, and again, eggs and Easter. Well, well here's, here's why. The egg is a lot like the tomb, right? Jesus was was died. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried inside the tomb. And then three days later, he came to life. And the interesting thing is the angel came, rolled the tomb away to show that the tomb was empty. Jesus was already gone, right? And so uh, they rolled the, the angel rolled the stone away and showed Jesus wasn't there anymore. That tomb was empty. And so the question is whether or not this tomb is empty, right? It's an egg, Originally, there should be a little yolk and white inside of the egg, right? Just like inside of a grave, there should be a dead body. When someone's dead, they get buried in a grave or get buried in a tomb. When an egg is laid, there's a yolk and a white inside of the egg. So what I want right now is if all the kids who are willing, if you would come on forward and parents, we're going to mix it up a little bit this year. We have a time-honored tradition in our church. If you're new, you're about to find out what it is. Uh, Kids, if you'd come forward, if you're comfortable, stand up on the stage. And parents, if you would just stand right beneath them, right here on the ground. So parents, right down here. Kids, right up here. Perfect, perfect. There we go. There we go. So Elijah, for instance, is standing right here, and his mommy is standing right there. Maybe she's going to sit to help make it easy. He's short. All right. <laughs> What's wrong, Levi? What's wrong? Come on forward. Come on forward. Oh man, I'm not gonna have enough eggs. <laughs> Got a lot of kids here today. What's that? Fun fact about chickens: if you crack an egg open, they'll actually eat the egg. And That's the true. That's true. They do do that. You got to be careful. All right. So now I want all the kids find your parent and stand right behind your parent. And if you're in a big family, then kind of huddle around that parent. Okay. All right. Are we huddled? Find your parent. Find your parental figure. Your legal guardian. Whoever spawned you, all right, good, good, we good, okay, we got a lot, we got a lot, okay, so Karis and Elijah, would you guys share that egg, would you share that together, and Leah and Nolan, would you guys share this egg, okay, and then would you three share these two eggs together here, there you go, you guys share that egg, okay, and would you guys share that? And here's another one. And here's one for you back here. There we go. You guys share those eggs. We don't quite have enough for everybody. So you're going to have to share. OK, you girls can share right there. Here you go. And there's three of you. So there's two eggs to share between the three of you. All right, here you two girls can share that egg. Here you go. Here, if you two would share that egg together. Here you go. If you guys would share that. And then um, here's another one. Well, you just hold on to those eggs right now. You just hold on to those. Here's another one over here. I got some extras. Who else needs one here? Who else? Right there. Here's another one. OK. So you guys ready? Now, if you're sharing an egg, what I want you to do is Karis and Elijah here, I want you to hold that egg together just like that. Great. OK. Now, what we're going to do is find out if Jesus really rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, there's not going to be any egg yolk or any egg white in that egg. It's going to be empty. And as a matter of fact, if he rose from the dead, instead of an egg yolk or egg white, there's going to be a gift. There's going to be a present or a surprise in there. 
So on the count of three, I want you to crack that egg on your parents' head and find out if Jesus really was or not. Are you ready? You're ready. Get that egg over the parents' head. Be sure to share hands. One, two, three. <laughs> Did he rise? Did he rise? There you go. Yeah, yeah, you got to really crush it there. Crush it. Crack it. Here, I'll help you. There you go. You ready? There you go. <laughs> Did he rise? <laughs> <laughs> there, there we go. All right, give them another hand. Way to go, kids. All right, kids, parents, you can, parents, you can take me later. Uh, I, I cheated a little because mine was already open. Oh, it was open a little bit. Did you cheat a little? Those are yours. Sorry. Parents, you can take me later. You're welcome. You're welcome. In our uh, sermon planning group, we talked about uh, having one real egg mixed in. We didn't. <laughs> You're welcome. And that's the tradition of the Easter egg. The tomb was empty and instead was a celebration. And And so after service today, kids, you are going to have an Easter egg hunt, and there's going to be eggs hidden out there, and I want you to remember Jesus and the tomb, and when you find that egg, you're not going to find a yolk and a white in there because Jesus isn't dead, he's alive, and he's not in that tomb, and he left you a present. And inside those eggs are little gifts, either little toys or little candies, and those are for you um, because Jesus rose from the dead and he left a little gift for us behind. And we'll talk today about what that gift is. Was that fun? Good, good. Praise God. All right. It's not Easter unless it's a mess. Um, <clears throat> so here's, here's the question. So evidence for the grave, for the empty, uh, evidence for the empty grave, evidence for the empty tomb. Um, the first question that we need to ask is, is this, the Bible here is the account. This is the record that we have that the grave was empty. People who saw, we believe, people who saw it wrote it down here, and now we can read it 2,000 years later. But the question is, was it really written by people who were there? Was this Bible really written by people who saw it? Because some people say that maybe it was written by people who lived a couple hundred years after Jesus was supposed to have died and come back to life. And the other question is, even if it was written by people who really saw it, that was 2,000 years ago, and people took the Bible and copied it down and gave it to someone else. And they took a Bible and they copied it and made a new copy and they gave it to someone else. And they took the Bible and they copied it down and they gave it to someone else. Isn't it likely that there's a ton of mistakes in that long transmission of process, that long process of passing the, passing, passing, passing the Word of God down from generation to generation? I mean, it, it just stands to reason that this isn't reliable anymore, that there's going to be tons of mistakes. So how can we really trust what's written in the Bible? And how do we know that the people who wrote it actually lived during the time of Jesus? And those are good questions. Um, and thankfully, really uh, smart people have dedicated their life to trying to answer these questions. Some of them are archaeologists who go out digging and researching. I, I was reading about one man who uh, went to uh, where they believe Mount Sinai was. And there's a monastery that they built where they thought Mount Sinai was. And he went there, and there were monks in the monastery. And this archaeologist, uh, this historian, went out there, and as he's talking to the monks, he noticed that it's cold. it was cold. They're in the, in the desert, and you guys know that the desert can get cold. And he noticed they had a wastebasket full of papers, parchments, and that they were stoking the stove with the papers. And this archaeologist looked at those papers and said, those look those look old. Those look really old. And so he grabbed the hand of the guy, stopped him, and he looked at him, and he found that they were actually um, Greek manuscripts of the Old and New Testament written within a couple hundred years of when Jesus was alive, and they were stoking the stove with <laughs> him. And so they, the guy said, wow, I've already, I've already gone through two basketfuls just like this. But thankfully, they were able to save a large uh, bulk of it. It's called the uh, Sinaiticus, um, and it was written about 325 A.D. or so. And, uh, and that's one of the most important manuscripts, and it's almost a complete set of the New Testament, aside from a few pages that got burned. Um, 
And, and so these archaeologists, these uh, scientists, these historians have gone all around the world finding old copies of the Bible throughout history. And what they have found is over 5,700 Greek manuscripts. That means they have found 500, 7,000 either complete sets of the Bible or books of the Bible or pages out of the Bible from way back in history, back when it was still written in Greek. 5,700 copies. And they've compiled these copies. They've looked them through. They've looked at the information in them. Um, I'm going to highlight one of them. It's called the John Ryland Fragment, or P52. It's the oldest one that we know of. Uh, and it is dated to around 100 to 150 AD. It's a text. It's a little credit card-sized piece of parchment. And on the front side is a couple verses from John 18. And on the back side are a few verses from John 18 a little bit later. And, and it was written, remember, 100 to 150 AD. That means it was written within 10 years from when we believe that John actually wrote the gospel. We think John wrote the gospel sometime around 90 AD. And this is dated to as early as 100, 100 to 150. So within 10 years, possibly, of the actual writing of John's gospel. And the words on this little credit card size piece from John 18 where, Pilate is, is, uh, where Jesus is on trial before Pilate, exactly the same as what we have today. Exactly the same. And, and so they found 5,700 of these little pieces or big books or whole pages. And what they have found, well, for instance, another one I'll just point out, P66 contains most of the Gospel of John. It's not a little credit, size, credit card size. It's most of the Gospel of John. And it was dated to 8,200. So about 50, 50 to 100 years after that credit card size piece. And again, just like the other, just like the Gospel of John that we have today. And it's almost a complete set of the Gospel of John. And what we found comparing these almost 6,000 manuscripts is that they are 98.33% the same. 98.33% of the letters are the same across from one manuscript to the other. And I think, well, okay, but 1.7%, that's kind of, you know, there's still margin for error there. Well, of that 1.7%, the bulk of it is spelling errors. The copyist, from one generation to the next, spelled a word a little different. Or spelled, instead of John, there's several names to spell the name John, several ways to spell the name John in Greek. And one time they said Silas, and another time they said Silvanus. And so when you take out the spelling errors and the, the name variations, you come out with 99.75% of the Bible across these six, almost 6,000 manuscripts. 99.75% of the Bible is the same. And remember, these texts date all the way back to within 10 to 50 years from when the Gospels and the, Bi the New Testament was actually written. And then when you look at that remaining quarter of a percent, there is nothing in there that changes any doctrine of faith. There's nothing in there that changes any tenet that we believe, any part of theology. It's, again, it's a couple, there's uh, 10 verses in John chapter 8 about the adulterous woman, the woman caught in adultery. There's uh, the second half of Mark chapter 16, and then a couple random verses here and there. It makes up that quarter of a percent. And you can take all of those out, and not one piece of anything that we believe about God and Jesus is changed in iota. And that is the hand of God taking care of the scripture down through the ages. Hallelujah. A, a matter of fact, uh, in page 55 of uh, Bart Ehrman, who is an agnostic, a New Testament critic who doesn't, doesn't know that he believes in God, and in his book, Misquoting Jesus, page 55, he admits that, in fact, most of the chapters, uh, most of the changes found in early Christian manuscripts have nothing to do with theology or ideology. This is an agnostic critic in the book, Misquoting Jesus. He says, far and away, the most changes are the result of mistakes, pure and simple slips of the pen, accidental omissions, inadvertent additions, misspelled words, blunders of one sort or another. Just these teeny little things. And these are the critics of the Bible. God is good. God is amazing. And, and if you'd put up that chart right there, um, just to compare what this looks like as opposed to um, other things from history that we take for granted, that they are true, that they are accurate, that they were written by who they said they were written, and that the things that are in them are actually what those people wrote. If you look at the works of Plato, 
uh, you know, Plato the famous philosopher, or the works of Herodotus, who was a historian who wrote about these, this time period, or earlier than this time period. If you look at uh, Caesar, remember Julius Caesar, who was killed at the Ides of March by Brutus, a tu Brute? Aristotle, the other uh, famous philosopher, Sophocles, a Homer who wrote the Iliad, that famous poem, the Odyssey. If you look, this chart shows how old those, how old they were, how long ago they lived, and then the earliest copy that we have of their works. So for instance, Aristotle, the famous philosopher, and we have books from him all over the place, the oldest manuscript we have of anything he wrote is 1,400 years after he wrote it. Now remember, the New Testament, we're talking 10 to 50 years. 10 to 50 years. But for Aristotle, 1,400 years. But nobody questions whether those, the writings of Aristotle are accurate. Nobody questions whether or not what Aristotle wrote really came from Aristotle or if it was true. Um, same thing, Homer, the Odyssey, that's the best attested manuscript they've got outside of the New Testament. 643 copies of it that they, they found. But the oldest one was 500 years after Homer lived. And that's the only one where they have enough copies that they found to, to, to test the degree of accuracy across copies to have enough to get a percentage. 95% accurate from one copy to the next. And the Bible here in this chart says 99.5%, depending on how you handle those spelling errors. And they question whether or not we have an accurate account of the Word of God, whether or not the Bible really was handed down to us. But they never question Plato. <laughs> we only have seven copies of his from 1,200 years after he lived. Just lets you know a little bit of the bias that exists towards the Word of God. If you treat the scripture the way that you treat any other historical work, there is no question. The Bible is accurate and reliable. The Bible was written at the time period when it says that it was written. And what was written is what we have today. End of story. Okay, let's move on. Um, if you want to read more about that, I'd recommend to you Josh McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Nice, big, thick book. He's actually got a new Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Nice, big, thick book. Or there's a more uh, simplified, compact, more than a carpenter. Uh, great books to read if you're curious about this kind of information. Second, can I trust what the Gospels wrote? The people who wrote the Gospels, were they telling the truth or were they lying? So, okay, they came from the time period of Jesus. They came from when Jesus lived. But how do I know that they weren't lying? Well, here's something to consider. We know that 10 out of the 12 apostles were martyred. Um, tradition tells us that Thomas was skinned alive. John wasn't martyred. He died a natural death. But uh, tradition says he was boiled in a pot of oil and God preserved him. Uh, we know that James uh, was killed with the sword, probably beheaded, which always ticks me off because he's my namesake and he was the first to die. I just thought that was lame. Um, and so you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs or these other books and find the horrific deaths of all these men, 10 of the disciples. Judas, of course, hung himself. He betrayed Jesus. Jesus. And uh, like I said, John died a natural death. But the other 10 were all martyred. And so the question is, who would die for something that they knew was a lie? Now, it's perfectly possible that if someone lies to you and you believe it, you could die. If someone lied to me and told me that a green light means uh, stop and a red light means go, and I believed that, I might die for that. Sure. Or if somebody lied to me and told me that this Kool-Aid is going to get me onto Haley Bop and I could you know, be in heaven, I might believe that lie and I could kill myself or I might be willing to die for that lie. But if I knew that it was a lie, why would I die? And not only die, but die a horrific and painful death. Now, these 10 men had a unique place in history. These were the witnesses to the resurrection. That was their role as apostles, is to tell people, yes, Jesus is alive. We saw it. That was their mission, and they fulfilled that mission beautifully. They went around the world, of the known world at that time, testifying to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they paid for it with their lives in gruesome, horrific ways. Do you think that all 10 men would hold, that not one of them would crack if they had gotten together and made up some lie about the resurrection? I don't think so. That seems pretty absurd to me, pretty unlikely. But then you might say, but if you read the Gospels, and especially the accounts of the resurrections, you'll notice there's some differences. Sometimes different lists of which women were there. Sometimes there's one angel at the tomb. Sometimes there's two angels. Was he sitting on the stone that was rolled away or was he inside of the tomb? 
There's these differences from one to the other. And don't those differences prove then that they're lying? Absolutely not. A matter of fact, if, uh, if you look at it from a uh, historical perspective or from um, the perspective of a, a legal perspective, trying to prove something in court, this is exactly what you would expect to find. That different eyewitnesses who had not collaborated, who had not worked together or talked beforehand to make sure their stories agreed, that they would get together and tell a story and that in all the essential details, they would be the same. A group of women came to the tomb early in the morning. There was no body. The stone was rolled away. An angel told them that he was alive. All the Gospels agree on that. And that if these independent witnesses, looking from different perspectives, different people recalling what they remembered from 10 years ago, were telling their story, that there would be little differences, that they would highlight or remember different parts of the story in different ways. Well, absolutely, you would expect to find that. As a matter of fact, if there weren't little differences in the secondary details, then you would have to assume that they were lying or that there was just one story that you were reading, not four different separate accounts. And, and that's actually one of the arguments um, that uh, Detective um, J. Warner Wallace, uh, he wrote the book Cold Case Christianity. And J. Warner Wallace is actually a uh, well-known and respective, he was a uh, well-known and respective cold case uh, homicide detective in L.A. County. Um, he solved cases that other detectives could not solve. And he kind of set the trend and established new norms in the court be through his work because he was so good at what he did. And just like I forgot to mention Josh McDowell, who was an agnostic who didn't believe in Jesus until he started researching the evidence, he actually, Josh McDowell, who wrote More Than a Carpenter and um, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, he wrote a research paper in college to disprove Christianity, and in the process of looking up the evidence to disprove Christianity, was converted. And here we have uh, J. Warner Wallace, same deal, he was an atheist. He grew up and was an outspoken atheist, spoke against Christianity until he looked at the Gospels and gave them the same degree of respect that he would give any other evidence on a cold case. And when he did that, he found that they were completely and totally reliable. And he wrote this book about how to think like a detective, how to use critical thinking, logic, reason, and approach the Gospels. And when you do that, you list out 10 different ways to do that, you find that's exactly what you would expect to find from a true account. Um, second, or excuse me, uh, third, the unreliability, or excuse me, the opposition. Aren't there other ways to explain what happened? The empty tomb. If, if the Gospels were really written when they said they were written, if the men gave their lives because that tomb was empty and they really believed that it was empty, aren't there other ways to explain that tomb being empty? And what did Jesus' opponents, those who didn't believe in the resurrection, what did they believe? What did they say? Uh, well, it would have been pretty easy to silence talk about the resurrection in Jerusalem by opening up that tomb and showing the body. It's pretty hard to claim a resurrection when there's a dead body in the grave. But they never did that. They never did that. Um, a matter of fact, what we find is uh, one is the Toledoth of Jesu. Uh, it's uh, written in uh, about the 400s, and it reflects um, an early tradition of Judaism that the disciples came to steal the body. In, in that retelling, they say that the body was hidden by a gardener, and that's why they couldn't find it. Um, in AD, uh, I'll read this quote from uh, Gary Habernas from Liberty University in his article, Ancient Non-Christian Sources. He says, additionally, Justin Martyr, who was writing at about 80, 150, uh, so just um, a generation or two after the resurrection, states that the Jewish leaders had even sent specially trained men around the Mediterranean, even to Rome, to further the teaching that Jesus' body had been stolen by the disciples. Uh, and that's confirmed by Tertullian, Tertullian, another writer, in AD 200, 50 years later. So why is that important? If the Jews are falling back on the story that the disciples came and stole the body, that means there is no body, right? That, that's, that's what I want you to hear there. There was no body in that tomb. That tomb was empty. Otherwise, their argument would have been very plain and simple. Here's the body. Jesus isn't risen. Instead, their argument, they had to come up with something else, because, which means we can understand, we can know, we can infer there was no body. And so their story was the body was stolen. Now, let me ask you this. If these 
men, what we know from the gospel writers, are hiding, hiding in a door, hiding in their room with the door shut for fear that their leader, who they believed was the Messiah and the Son of God, they just watched him be horrifically crucified. He died. Now they're disillusioned. They thought he was the king, but he's dead. And so they're hiding, and they're pretty sure they're going to be dead next. Do you think these men would go fight off Roman soldiers, open up a sealed tomb, steal a dead body, and then give up their life and die saying that the body had actually been risen from the dead? No. Absolutely not. That's, that's absurd. Other people have said, maybe Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, the swoon theory. Or maybe it was the wrong tomb. Maybe Joseph of Arimathea, when he buried Jesus in his own tomb, according to all four of the Gospels, maybe he was confused. Maybe the women were confused, as if they could miss such an important detail. All these different arguments fall far short. None of them hold any water. None of them are believable. Um, if you'd like to investigate that more, I'd point you towards Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. Uh, again, Lee Strobel is another atheist who was an investigative journalist, who was the uh, editor, uh, legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, who set out to disprove Christianity, and just like Josh McDowell, when he was confronted with the evidence, was convinced and went from being an outspoken atheist to a believer in Christ. And not only a believer in Christ, but somebody who went around arguing the case for the resurrection. The case for Christ. And he, he lists off all the different explanations that we could come up with for the empty tomb, and none of them hold water. The most believable story is that Jesus was telling the truth, that he really did rise from the dead. So the tomb was empty. Even the opponents didn't argue the fact that the tomb was empty. So if the tomb was empty... Oh, and why? And we just talked about all the different arguments and all of them fall short. But the question remains, if you put up that next tomb slide, if the tomb was empty and there's no other good explanation for why, then what do you get from an empty grave? If Jesus really did rise from the dead, what does that mean for you and I? And when we're confronted with what is basically a historical fact that that tomb was empty, what do you do? How do you respond? As we think about that, I want to look at different ways that the, that the people who lived in that era responded. Um, first off, we've got the example of the ten disciples. Uh, Thomas is the one that gets singled out as the skeptic, but it's, uh, it's really not fair. Um, because uh, we'll look at the scripture here in just a second that says, Thomas says, when all the other disciples saw Jesus alive, Thomas wasn't there. The other nine, uh, the other ten saw him. Thomas wasn't there. And Thomas says, well, I'm not going to believe it till I get to see it. And we point at Thomas and say, man, he had such a lack of faith, but none of the rest of them except John believed either. John was the only one who believed that Jesus had risen from the dead before they actually saw Jesus in the flesh. So Thomas gets the bad rap, but all 10 of, other than John were skeptics. And here's, the th here's, here's what they would say to themselves. I've been burned before. I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I trusted that Jesus was the Messiah, and then he died. I watched him die. My hopes and dreams were crushed when he died. I left, I gave up everything to follow Jesus. And I've been disappointed. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Not going to fool me twice. Um, and so they say, I'll believe it when I see it. And why don't we look at that, that scripture text. John chapter 20, verse 25. So the other disciples who saw Jesus, who touched Jesus, who watched Jesus actually eat something in front of them say, I'm not a ghost. I really am alive. The other disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hands into his side where they pierced him with that spear, I will not believe. And how many of us are confronted with a sermon like this, are confronted with these books, this evidence, this, this mountain of evidence, and say, yeah, but that's not enough. I need a little bit more before you're going to convince me. You're not going to pull the wool over my eyes. I'm an intelligent uh, skeptic. I, I, I think for myself, no thank you. And the question is, when is enough evidence enough? 
when is enough ever going to be enough? For Thomas, he says, enough will be enough when I actually put my fingers into the nail holes. Then I'll believe. Let me look at the happens next. John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, have you, uh, so Jesus, they are back together on Sunday, the next Sunday, a week later, and Jesus shows up again. And Jesus uh, says, Thomas, I want you to put your finger into the nail holes and take your hand and put it into the side. And Thomas falls down on his knees. is like, my Lord and my God, <laughs> you are the Messiah. Okay, I believe. Truth, I, you win. And Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who don't actually get to put their finger hole, fingers in the nail holes. That's you and me. That's most people alive today, aside from some people in, in uh, is Muslim nations who got to see visions of the resurrected Jesus Christ because none of us were brave enough to go and be missionaries to them. Jesus himself went in visions. Aside from them, none of us have gotten to actually see the resurrected Jesus. And Jesus says, having not seen but still believing, we're blessed. Peter describes it this way. Um, years later, Peter writes to the believers who didn't get to see Jesus like he did. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is the blessing of faith. It's the joy, it's the hope, and it is the receiving of salvation. We all put our faith into something. Those of us who are skeptics who say, I'll believe in Christianity when God reveals himself to me. Then I'll believe. The truth is you already believe something. It, 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 I don't have time in this message to go into evolution and, and poke holes in the theory there. I don't have time in this message to go into other world religions or, or whatever and talk about the holes in those beliefs. But no matter what you believe, whether you're an atheist or a Hindu, whether you believe in evolution, the Big Bang, whatever it is, you have faith in that thing because none of those beliefs have been proven. None of them hold water. None of them are without faults. And so you have to decide, what am I going to put my faith in and what am I going to believe? And personally, I believe there is more evidence for a creation and a creator than any theory of evolution. And there is more evidence for an empty grave and a resurrection than any idea that some man could swoon on the cross and come back and fight off the guards and come back to life. Jesus is risen. And I have to take a step of faith to believe that. But it takes faith to believe anything. And there's a blessing in the gospel, and I want it. And God's message to you today is stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Because I mean, what's the end result of believing if you choose to put your faith in this far-fetched theory of evolution? What's the end result? Or humanism, but depression, (laughs) hopelessness, a lack of morality, the corruption and falling apart of the world around us. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what is the end result? The end result is faith and hope, joy and excitement for the future. The end result is righteousness and godliness. The end result is healthy families. The end result is the kingdom of God on earth. And I want to be in that kingdom. Second, the, the guards. The guards uh, also saw the empty tomb. According to Matthew's gospel, the angel came, and we'll look at this scripture in just a second, the angel came down and they fell like dead men. Uh, but how did they respond? They ran away to the priests and asked them for help and for protection. It, it, here's their response. It was fear. This is way beyond what I'm comfortable with. You can go ahead and go back to that next slide, that last slide. This is way beyond what I'm comfortable with. And it's kind of cost me more than I want to pay. See, here's the problem for the guards. It was their responsibility to make sure that Jesus stayed in that grave. And he didn't. And now their necks are on the line. If they go back and they say, uh, well, we lost him, (laughs) right? That's not going to go over very well for these guards. And so they were afraid. And not only were they afraid of what Pilate might do to them, they were afraid 
of that angel. And, and just to highlight that, there's a video clip from a, a movie called Risen that I want you guys uh, to watch right now. It's about three minutes long. Um, it's powerful. And it's, it's a perspective, one perspective, of uh, what the guards... No more lies. How did they take him? What happened to the Nazarene's body? You forgot us. Forgot? We'd had no supper. That's why the wine made us slumber. Yeah, 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 yeah. We slept. <laughs> We've been up two days since the crucifixion. And what could happen? Guarding the body of a dead man, so. We closed our eyes and turned for a bit until. Until what? Until we was wakened by this terrible. It's terrible. It's a terrible flash. The night was gone. And the air smelt burned and the, the ropes, they just, they just exploded. And the stone flew like a leaf and all of a sudden the sun rose in the tomb. It was the sun. It was, it was everything. And then a figure, a figure appeared that I could not gaze upon because of the terrible light and it wasn't a man. It wasn't. And there was this voice all around that I could not fathom. And then, and then we were running, we ran so far, so far and until we could, until we could think again. And then we went and told the priests because because that's what you, that's what you bade us do. And Caiaphas paid you for a different story. Jibion, I have seen much in the service of the emperor. Cannibals in, and the blue Celts in Gaul and uh, I've seen a man taken by a serpent at sea. Never have I witnessed a moment so, so. Explain it to me. Um, all right. So, like I said, that was Risen. Um, I. Personally, I love that movie. I think they did a great job with it. Uh, there is some violence in the beginning. It's not recommended for all ages. Um, they are setting the stage of the violent relationship between Rome and the Jews. So if you're queasy about violence, I wouldn't recommend it. But otherwise, it's a great way to celebrate Easter. Um, there's some pretty powerful moments in that movie. And when I asked uh, Columbia Pictures for permission to show the clip, they mentioned that uh, people can watch the film on Pure Flix streaming service this month with a free seven-day trial. So there you go. Okay, <laughs> um, so you can see there, what I love about that depiction of the guard is the fear, whoa, the fear that, uh, that was so evident in him, right? Like, like he saw this angel come down from heaven and an earthquake and the stone roll away and this blinding light, and this poor guy had no idea how to understand that. Like, what does that mean? What just happened? He's, he's this pagan Roman with probably very little exposure to the teachings of Jesus, and he's terrified. And he could lose his life because he just lost the dead body. And not only that, but what on earth just happened? And so for some of us, when we come to the empty grave, what we find there is fear. Fear. And there could be different reasons for that. Uh, a, a being that is beyond our control and our understanding, who created everything and to whom we are answerable. Um, that, that if this truth of the empty grave, that, that it, if Jesus came back from the life, from the dead, it came back to life from the dead, that he is who he says he is, that he is the king, what does that mean for the way that I live? Suddenly, I'm not in control of my own life anymore. I might lose the right and the authority to dictate how I live. I might not be the master of my own domain anymore. And there's some fear there in surrendering our sovereignty, our independence to Jesus. And so if we are responding in fear 
to that empty grave. Then I just point this out. Truth is truth, regardless of whether or not you want to believe it. If Jesus rose from the dead, it doesn't require your acknowledgement to be true. And you are going to lay your life down to Jesus someday, either right now willingly or when Jesus comes back as king. He promised that he would come back from the dead, and he did. He also promised that he is going to come back to earth someday as king of kings and lord of lords, and he is going to judge the living and the dead, and he's going to keep that promise now as well. And, and he is going to make a new heaven and a new earth for those who are willing to lay their lives down for him. Our lives are forfeit one way or the other. And whether we're afraid to believe it or not, it's still truth. Some uh, respond with opposition. The priests, um, in, uh, they, these are the people who don't want to believe it. They're uh, uh, confronted with it. It makes them angry. It, it, it violates their sense of right and wrong. It violates their worldview. And they want to stamp out this belief, whatever they can do. And we see that demonic hostility in our culture today. Not just a passive, I'm not sure if I believe or not, but a violent opposition despite the evidence. Do the claims of the gospel make you angry? Do they threaten your identity, sexual identity, religious identity, moral identity, your moral constructs of right or wrong? Do they threaten the intellectualism or social ideology you've based your life and your self-worth on? Here's God's word to you today. Stop fighting. Stop running. It's time to surrender. Jesus is not out to ruin your life. He's not out to harm you. If you surrender your life to him, if you give him control as Lord as well as Savior, his mission is to rescue and restore you to all that you were meant to be, more than you can imagine right now. Jesus wants to restore who you are on the inside, to deal with your shame, to war against your addiction and your bondage, to set you free from yourself and help you become the person that you were created to be from before the beginning of time. Jesus came to those who were his enemies and died for them to make them his friends and his beloved for all time, if we would but surrender. And then there's Mary. Mary came to the cross with grief. This is more than I can bear right now. I, I can't believe what I'm seeing. I don't have time. I don't have the ability, the, the, the headspace to process what I'm seeing. And if you put up that passage, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Jesus said to her, uh, Mary has just uh, been to the empty tomb. She's seen that Jesus isn't there. She saw an angel who said, what are you doing looking for a living man in a dead tomb? And she turns around and sees Jesus, but her eyes are so blurred with her tears or his identity is hidden from her. She says, she thinks he's the gardener. And Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing Jesus to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried away his body, tell me where you've laid him and, and I will go and take him away. Jesus just saw the empty tomb, the grave clothes laying there and saw an angel of God. But she was so overcome by her grief at the loss of Jesus, the inside of her, that she didn't even process or understand in her mind what she just saw. It didn't click for her. She was overcome by her grief. For some, the pain and grief of past loss has made our hearts heavy. It's too difficult to believe that God is good or that he could be bringing good from the painful road that we're walking. We're so consumed by grief that we don't recognize what God is doing right in front of our noses. But the beautiful thing is how obviously Jesus loved Mary. He cared for Mary. He singled her out. She was the first one who got to see him after he came back from the dead. And in her grief, in her pain, in her loss, Jesus took the time to say, Mary, I am right here with you. He loved her in her grief. And if you come today with a heavy heart, whether life's circumstances have been more than you thought you could bear, Jesus loves you 
And he's waiting for your recognition that he has never left you, even in the darkest moments. Right now, uh, before we look at the final reaction of faith, I want to go ahead and come forward and receive communion. Um, so the way that we're going to do this today is a little different. Um, I'm just going to put these here on the stage. Um, and there's going to be four uh, rows, four lines that you guys can get into to just come forward and grab uh, that communion and take it back to your seats and hold on to it. And then we'll take it all together as we look at that final reaction to the gospel. Um, Cindy, if you would go ahead and come on up. Thank you. And if you're watching online, uh, I just encourage you, take this moment right now and uh, find some bread, some juice, some crackers, something at home to celebrate communion with us together. You guys can go ahead and come on forward. So, I love the passage in John chapter 20 that describes Peter and John running, running to the tomb after Mary had come and told them that Jesus wasn't there. Peter and John left everybody else and they sprinted to the tomb. And I, I love how John 
who's writing that account mentions that he got there first. Um, he, he beat Peter. But then he got there and he stopped and he hesitated. He didn't go right in. And Peter went right in. And if you'd put that passage up there. Simon Peter came following him, after him, slowpoke, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen clothes lying there. And so when Jesus disappeared, like, like imagine I'm wearing grave clothes wrapped up kind of like a mummy. And if my body weren't here, but my clothes were still laid out perfectly, just like there was a body, the socks, the shoes, the pants, the shirt, the vest, all right where they would be. But the body had disappeared. That's what they found in the tomb. They, they found his grave clothes that no one could get out of on their own, just laying there perfectly. His body went right through them. And then the, the napkin that had been placed over his face was folded up neatly and placed to the side. And then, uh, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. And then if you go forward. Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. See, John is the one out of the 11 living disciples who believed without seeing Jesus. He's the only one. It's contrasted here with Peter who got there first and went barged right in. When John saw the empty tomb and the grave clothes lying there, that was enough for him. And he said, Jesus is risen. What he promised has come true. He fulfilled his word. He did exactly what he said he would do. Hallelujah. And then when you look at the, the response of the women, if you'd put up that slide, uh, go ahead and go on forward. It says, Matthew 28, the women departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy after listening to the angel, and they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And that is the response that is appropriate when confronted with an empty grave. You are the son of God. You were dead and you have come back to life. You are the king. You have fulfilled your promise. You are who you said you are. They didn't hesitate. They fell down at his feet and worshipped him as the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the savior who gave up his life for us. And today, I pray that you would have that same response of faith and worship in your own heart as we come to that empty tomb. Jesus isn't there anymore. He is risen. Amen. We're about to take this communion together. But the Bible says that this communion is meant for those who have received Jesus Christ into their own life. Jesus died to forgive us. Jesus died in our place so we could be made righteous. That means that when God looks at us, he doesn't see my sin and my mistakes. He sees Jesus because Jesus is living inside of me. His character, his righteousness, his spirit, it's in me. I'm covered by the goodness of Jesus. And when God looks at me, he sees me just as right as Jesus does. And so when I eat this bread and juice, I'm saying, Jesus, he lives inside of me. But you shouldn't eat this bread and juice if you don't believe that. And if you haven't received that, if you would like to receive that gift that Jesus is giving to you, the tomb is empty and we come and receive that gift simply by faith and worship, believing that Jesus is risen from the dead and confessing him as Lord, you're brought into the family of God. You're made new. And if you would like to take that step of faith today, to ask Jesus to forgive you, to in faith give your life to him, would you just raise your hand and ask him? And we will pray together right now. If anyone would like to make that confession of faith, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I believe you came from the dead for me. Raise your hand right now and we'll pray together. Amen, Ronnie. That's right, little man. Amen, amen. Would you all pray with me? Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus. That he died for my mistakes. But then he came back to life. <laughs> to set me free from the fear of death. I pray for his life to live in me now. 
Please make me your child. Forgive my sins. I give myself to you. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. And now all together, we're going to take this communion, this bread that symbolizes the pierced body of Jesus. Just like it's striped with these burn marks, his body was striped for us, his hands were pierced for us. Just like this bread is flattened, he was crushed under the weight of our sins. This symbolizes the body of Jesus that was broken for us. And when we eat it, we're saying, Jesus, I believe you live in me. You are broken for me. I want to live for you now and be a part of your body forever, to be a part of you and your family. Would you take that bread with me? Do you believe that? And as we take this cup, Jesus said that this cup is the blood of a new covenant. <laughs> the old days, they didn't pinky swear. They didn't spit in their hand and shake. There had to be the shedding of blood for a promise like a covenant to be made. And Jesus said, this is the blood that I'm shedding to make a promise with you that I will forgive you, that I will accept you into my family, and that just like I came back to life, you will come back to life someday. And if you believe that and you receive that, then would you drink this cup with me and say, Jesus, I want your life and mine, and I pour out my life for yours in your name. Hallelujah. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you and thank you for rising from the dead, for defeating death on our behalf. Lord, for defeating our sin, for defeating our weakness and giving us your strength and life. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And now I pray that you guys would have a wonderful, blessed Easter as you celebrate with your family. Kids, that tomb is empty. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt right up there in about 10 minutes. There's some treats for the families. So if uh, parents, either some donut holes, some little snacks there. 12 and under, Julie says. 12 and under, kids. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, Andy. I know you're thinking about it. 12 and under. Uh, you guys are dismissed. Have a wonderful Easter celebration, and we look forward to seeing the families just right in this room right here in about 10 minutes.